Okay, welcome everybody uh, to our first SOAS Japan Research Center seminar of 2021. Um, I'm Helen McNaughton, I'm the chair of the Japan Research Center at SOAS. And um, I was going to say Happy New Year, but I instead am going to say Happy Inauguration Day to all our uh, American colleagues and friends who are perhaps dialing in today, not least our uh, guest speaker. Uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome Will Gardner to kick off our uh, 2021 sessions for us. Uh, Will is um, dialing in from Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania, so he's not too far from the main events that are happening down the road today in Washington, D.C. Uh, he, at Swarthmore, he teaches Japanese language, literature, and film. Uh, and he has written and published numerous articles on Japanese modernism, science fiction, media, and urban culture. And today he's going to be presenting highlights from his recent 2020 book, uh, which has been published by the University of Minnesota Press. Uh, it's titled The Metabolist Imagination, Visions of the City in Post-War Japanese Architecture and Science Fiction. So Will is going to speak for about 45, 50 minutes today. You will notice down the bottom of your screens that there is a Q, there are two buttons there. There's a chat button and a Q&A button. Um, we are going to have a Q&A session at the end of uh, Will's presentation for about half an hour. So if you have any questions, uh, please put them into the Q&A button rather than the chat button. So please use the Q&A button at the end of the presentation. And I will try and collect as many questions as possible for Will to answer. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Will. Um, he's going to upload his presentation. I'm going to turn my camera off so we can concentrate on his slides. And I'll, I'll come back um, when he's finished his presentation. But welcome, Will. It's a, a real pleasure to have you here joining us. Well, thank you very much, Helen, and I, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, so I'll go ahead and share my slides. Um, you see that okay? That's great. Okay. Um, so welcome, everyone, and I appreciate um, everyone who's joining us. I know that there are um, other things happening on TV today, so uh, I appreciate you, uh, you uh, choosing to um, join us for this talk, and um, I will be talking, um, as Helen said, about my um, recent uh, publication, um, which is called The Metabolist Imagination, and um, these are the, uh, the main themes that I'll be talking about today. First of all, um, this is a book that, um, that is uh, interdisciplinary in the sense that it connects um, architecture and science fiction. Um, and uh, my own um, background as a scholar is in literary studies, so I'm not an ar architectural historian. Um, and it's rather unusual to pair these two art forms, I think, in an academic um, um, book. But, um, but I was, uh, you know, in prepping for this um, research project, I was really struck by um, some very strong commonalities um, in themes between um, science fiction in the post-war era, as well as um, architecture, as I will discuss. Um, so I will kind of um, discuss that connection a little bit more at the beginning of the talk. Um, and uh, the um, I'm going to focus today uh, kind of some highlights really from the book, um, talking about three um, themes that I believe kind of emerge in the writings and um, architectural plans of architects who are associated with a, a group called metabolism or the metabolist architects. And I'll, I'll, I'll speak about them in a minute. Um, but the themes that I think are also kind of pertinent to um, Japanese science fiction are um, the themes of mega structures and the idea of expansion across Tokyo Bay. Um, secondly, the idea of a capsule as an architectural form um, and the idea of cyborgs and cyborg architecture. Um, and um, C would be um, the theme of apocalypse 
and um, the theme of ruins as architect, as architecture. <clears throat> and, uh, and finally, in the third section of the talk, I'm going to um, connect these themes with um, um, some relatively well-known works um, of anime uh, um, by Otomo Katsuhiro, uh, the, the famous um, sort of cyberpunk animation Akira um, from 1988, and um, Oshi Mamoru, who is uh, a director probably best known for Ghost in the Shell, um, but I'm going to be discussing um, two, uh, two movies um, that are connected with a franchise that he worked on, on um, uh, called Pat Labor. So uh, I'll be talking about um, some of those same themes that you see in section two as they apply to, um, to these works. Um, so first of all, about this connection uh, between um, architecture and science fiction. So um, in this work, I look at architecture and science fiction um, as two forms of artistic simulation. Um, so I argue that the architect imagines an intervention in the human and natural environment. Um, that is the architectural plan will propose a change in the existing natural or constructed environment um, and the lives of its imagined inhabitants. Um, similarly, um, fiction and especially science fiction or speculative fiction, SF as it's also known, um, is a form of imaginative simulation, uh, positing a change or novelty in the natural built or social environment and tracing its narrative consequences. So um, in a sense, I'm looking at uh, these two art forms there as two forms of simulation um, uh, in, uh, in terms of, of what the architect and what the writer or filmmaker do. Mm. Okay, um, and in particular, uh, the architectural group that I focus on in the study, um, the metabolists, uh, I think their work in particular points to a narrative dimension. Um, and so I argue that the metabolists were interested in the processes of growth, change, and um, decay. And they imagined architecture as a means of understanding and designing such dynamic processes. Thus, architecture could be approached as a temporal form, uh, responding in part to the new uh, diachronic possibilities of computer simulation, which was just kind of um, emerging on the conceptual horizon um, at the time that this group um, debuted. Um, but it also linked um, to the temporality and tropes of narratives. Um, and I don't, I'm not going to talk about it too much today, but a number of the figures, uh, architects and architecture critics associated with Metabolus actually employed the fiction, you know, prose fiction genre or sort of hybrid um, fiction slash essay, architectural essay form to kind of express their ideas. Um, so, uh, so there are, we can find actually sort of literal narratives in the written work of architects and architecture um, critics that uh, are affiliated with this metabolist group. Um, and um, so, uh, so that is, is more or less the conceptual uh, connection between architecture and science fiction that I explore in the book. But I also explore um, uh, some of the sort of human interconnections um, between uh, architects and writers in the post-war era. Um, and in particular, um, one event that I focus on um, that's not going to be the focus of my talk today, but is um, the focus of a chapter in the book um, is the 1970 Osaka Expo. Um, and this Osaka Expo um, was really the site of a very interesting collaboration between um, uh, um, figures from a number of different fields, including architecture, of course, um, art, um, but also science fiction, and in particular, the author Komatsu Sakyo um, was very active in the planning and even staging and even, um, in a sense, architectural design of one portion of the theme zone um, being responsible for the underground exhibit 
in the uh, theme zone area. Um, so, uh, so he uh, collaborated, as you can see, this photograph um, taken um, in 1969 uh, with Komatsu on the left and the architect uh, Kurokawa Kisho on the right. Um, so, uh, so, you know, one other thing that I think fascinates me about this era is the actual um, interconnections, uh, per interpersonal connections between um, some of these figures. And, um, and Komatsu wasn't the only uh, uh, person affiliated with science fiction in some way who worked on this Osaka Expo. In fact, there were a lot of other science fiction writers and um, uh, mangaka, et cetera, who participated, um, but, uh, but he's certainly the most prominent and the one that I focus on the most in the book. <clears throat> so um, just to give you an idea, this is a photograph of the site of the uh, 1970 Osaka Expo. And you can see here the very colorful and unusually shaped pavilions um, kind of spread across the site. Um, you see the very uh, prominence of sort of um, uh, infrastructure in, in sense of um, there was a sort of monorail that connected this uh, site to the city of Osaka. Um, there was a, a also um, a rail that um, that went around the outside in the perimeter, and there were these sort of moving sidewalks which connected various pavilions. Um, so there, it was a site of a kind of futuristic infrastructure, um, and it was built in the press and by some of the um, folks who were con conceptualizing the event as a kind of simulation of a city of the future. Um, so this term Mirai Toshi or city of the future was uh, was one that is associated with um, this uh, particular expo. Um, and uh, probably the most famous um, landmark in the, uh, in the Osaka Expo um, was this uh, tower kind of sculpture designed by uh, famous uh, artist Okamoto Taro. Um, and uh, in the original uh, um, expo, this uh, tower actually sort of inter sort of penetrated through the roof um, of the so-called Festival Plaza, um, which was designed by Tange Kenzo, who was probably the most famous architect of the 20th century in Japan, an important associated with many kind of state projects in Japan, um, and who was the sort of mentor, uh, one of the key uh, mentors of the architects of the metabolist group. <clears throat> and um, so that uh, Festival Plaza, the building no longer stands, but, um, but if you go to Osaka today, you can still see um, Okamoto Taro's Tower of the Sun and it's be kind of, become a kind of beloved landmark um, in uh, sort of suburban Osaka. And um, so, um, yes. So to return um, just briefly, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Komatsu Sakyo, um, the writer, um, he is, um, in addition to being associated with the Osaka Expo, actually known for sort of um, apocalyptic science fiction and sort of disaster narratives in science fiction. And um, two of his most famous works, just to mention, um, one of them is called uh, Katsu no Hi, or the Day of Resurrection, which is also known as Virus, the Day of Resurrection, or just Virus. Um, and it's one of the earliest um, science fiction narratives of a kind of uh, killer virus, um, a virus that's actually been manipulated by human beings, um, which escapes and, uh, and wipes out civilization across the planet, um, except for a small group of, uh, a sort of international group of researchers who are on Antarctica. Um, and the environment of Antarctica is too cold for the virus to, um, to, uh, <clears throat> to replicate. So, um, so that they are the only human beings spared. And, um, and so this is a very, uh, so this is one of Komatsu's earliest works and one which certainly um, is, is a sort of uh, um, somewhat uh, kind of disturbing, um, uh, from the, the from perspective, of course, today of, of what is happening with the global pandemic today, um, but uh, a work that I think will probably continue to get attention in the coming years. <clears throat> 
Um, however, uh, Komatsu's most famous work is uh, probably um, Japan Sinks, um, which is a novel from 1972, um, right after that, therefore, right after his period of collaboration for the Osaka Expo. Um, and uh, this is a work where the title kind of says it all. Um, the idea behind the work is that the whole archipelago of Japan um, sinks underneath the Pacific Ocean in a giant sort of seismic um, cataclysm. And, uh, and this is a very interesting work that I also discuss in the book. <laughs> um, but it's also a turned, uh, you know, been a very popular work in the sense of a work that has become a kind of cultural touchstone in Japan. You hear this phrase, uh, Nihon Timbotsu, from time to time uh, when various bad events happen in Japan. Um, and, uh, and most recently, there's been a new uh, anime on Netflix um, that is sort of loosely based on this story. So it's a story that has definitely had legs in, in Japanese culture. <clears throat> so um, going back to metabolism, um, and I just wanted to say a little bit about the metabolist movement for folks who may not be too familiar with this um, particular episode of architectural history. Um, so the metabolist movement, um, uh, was born in the year 1960, and um, it, uh, it was a kind of outgrowth of the World Design Conference, which was held in 1960. Um, and uh, a group of architects, um, uh, some of whom had been sort of mentored, as I mentioned, by Tange Kenzo, um, but they, uh, um, Tange at this time was actually at MIT, so uh, another sort of mentor figure Asada Takashi um, sort of convened a group of young architects um, around the idea of sort of proposing something bold, um, sort of highlighting the most sort of bold and innovative ideas among young Japanese architects. Um, and, and they put together this kind of book, um, which is sort of like a manifesto called Metabolism, the Proposals for New Urbanism. Um, and they sort of distributed it at this conference. Um, and uh, so as I mentioned before, the idea of metabolism is to conceive and design buildings and other urban forms, not in terms of built, completed, or even potentially completed plans or structures, but rather as um, entities capable of ongoing processes of metamorphosis. Um, just as the material of a living organism undergoes a constant process of birth, growth, decay, and replenishment. So obviously metabolism is kind of organic metaphor um, that refers to this uh, type of um, potential for growth and sort of thinking of architecture therefore um, as a kind of process rather than an endpoint. Mm. And this type of organic uh, metaphor was really highlighted in the book design um, of this book. Uh, um, uh, the designer Awazu Kiyoshi was the book designer. And um, you see, uh, you see you know, a nebula, for example, being featured uh, or a, 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 um, a galaxy. And you see architectural forms that resemble cells of the human body or, or natural cells of, uh, of an organism. Um, and, uh, and then you see some of these bold um, architectural uh, designs. <clears throat> and um, just to, to return to the Osaka Expo for a moment, Kurokawa Kisho. So the Osaka Expo really became a kind of bookend for the metabolist movement in a sense that uh, this movement was most active in the years in 1960 through 1970, and um, the 1970 Expo became a real kind of showcase for metabolism and metabolist architectures, architecture and um, ideas. And, um, and so we see, for example, Kurokawa Kisho's um, Toshiba IHI Pavilion, which has um, these sort of external structures that are sort of um, supporting the building from the outside, but you see this, uh, this kind of um, replicable um, shape here where we have the sense of kind of almost organically uh, 
um, this structural element could replicate itself and sort of grow almost virally from um, this point and sort of spread out into the environment. Um, and this was kind of uh, one of the ideas. And I think that this building really kind of shows that sort of organicism and dynamism potentiality um, in a kind of pedagogical way, you know, as, as a form of architectural exposition. Mm. Um, so today, uh, the three themes that I'd like to talk about um, from the book um, are uh, um, the idea of a mega structure um, and, uh, and uh, also the idea of mega structures um, and the development over Tokyo Bay as a kind of imaginative territory. Um, and, uh, excuse me. Um, so yes, so this is the first of the three themes that I'll discuss. Um, so, uh, so a megastructure, obviously kind of a, you know, that the name implies just a very large building. Um, and one of the things that I sort of highlight in the book is that this sort of imagination of large, you know, I think is, is a sort of key sort of science fiction imagination of what the city will look like in the future, right? That it's going to get big and, and this idea of, sort of giant buildings as, as something of the future. But, um, but a megastructure in the sense, uh, this word actually in, in some cases has been um, attributed to an architect, uh, Maki Fumihiko, who has also uh, participated in the Metabolism uh, Manifesto, um, although he was um, a somewhat in, in a group, a small group, subgroup that was, um, uh, that distinguishes itself a, a little bit, uh, distances itself a little bit from the main, um, the main group of architects uh, um, such as Kurokawa that I mentioned before. Um, but in, in any case, um, he, he also, he wrote about mega structures um, and his definition was a large frame in which the functions of a city or a part of a city are housed. Um, and so, uh, so this idea of a frame um, which then is distinguished between a discrete, rapidly changeable functional units, which fit within the larger framework. So this idea of changeability of units sort of within a framework is, is one of the key ideas actually of metabolism as, as we'll, we'll see uh, in a moment. Um, but, uh, but I think that this idea of also a building, which is also a city, um, which, which contains within it the functions of a city is also um, sort of a key concept. And, um, and we can think, you know, in works of science fiction um, outside of Japan, you know, we, we, can, we can point to megastructures um, that I think fit Maki's definitions in some ways, um, uh, such as uh, Fritz Lang's uh, new uh, The New Tower of Babel from Fritz Lang's Metropolis classic science fiction film, um, or uh, for example, the Tyrell um, corporation headquarters from um, Ridley Scott's Blade Runner. Um, or, and I would say these are kind of dystopian me megastructures in, in a lot of ways. Um, but, uh, but we also have actually within uh, Japanese science fiction, um, uh, the idea of a megastructure being explored in Komatsu Sakyo's um, novel, um, City in the Air 008 which um, was uh, actually, he was writing just at the point he was collaborating with the metabolists. And he um, basically explicitly incorporates kind of metabolist ideas and metabolist sort of mega structures within the narrative of this work. Mm. Um, so, so here is a design, uh, actually uh, the design itself precedes the metabolist manifesto, but it was featured in the Metabolist Manifesto. And this is by the architect Kikutake Kiyonori. Um, and here, so we see a tower-shaped community. So the building itself is, is, is envisioned, you know, kind of explicitly as a self-contained community that almost as if the building itself were a city. Um, and, um, and this, uh, like a number of Metabolist uh, uh, idea uh, sort of designs, addresses some of the concerns um, around uh, the environmental crisis in Japan um, around the year, so this is 1950s, 1960s, but already sort of pollution, 
and congestion in post-war Japan, which was rapidly urbanizing, rapidly industrializing. This is the high growth period in Japanese history. Um, so, uh, so we have these many issues of urban sprawl, of, um, of traffic, of the loss of the natural environment. And, uh, and this design was, was, in a, it was an attempt to address some of those issues and in effect sort of gathering um, the uh, inhabitants of this sprawling sort of megapolis of, of Tokyo um, and, and sort of consolidating them in these, these giant tower communities, um, which would then be surrounded by um, open countryside and, and green. And so it was conceived of as a way to introduce um, green um, and, uh, and to the city. And, um, and this actually connects with Komatsu's um, sort of utopian work of juvenile science fiction, City in the Air 008, which also kind of features um, the name of the sort of tower city in this work is called um, Aozora or Blue Sky. Um, and, uh, and it features the sort of um, imagination of a world of the future without um, pollution. Um, and, uh, and another sort of um, interesting feature of this tower state community is that the, um, the living unit, uh, you see the sort of bubbles on the surface of this tower, and those are actual units which can be, um, which can be replaced after the sort of life cycle of say one generation of inhabitants. Um, when the sort of unit wears out, it actually can be um, retrieved into the core of this building where there's a kind of giant furnace um, and the sort of metal, metal um, unit is melted down and sort of recycled and then returned to the tower. Um, so the tower is kind of constantly replenishing itself um, like a, a natural organism. Um, and Kikutake uh, around the same time also, uh, so I'm sorry, this is just a slide um, showing this notion of sort of interchangeability uh, or sort of removability, uh, movability of these uh, living units. Um, and, uh, um, and so, and Kikutake also um, at the same time was working on um, sort of designs of future cities and uh, that actually floated over the water. Um, and this was another of the themes that was quite prominent in his work. Um, and so talking about sort of cities over the water, this is another sort of area of imagination of the metabolist architects. Um, and, uh, and probably the most, um, one of the signature works, um, and this is sort of speaking of metabolism loosely to connect its mentor, um, Tange Kenzo, um, is the, uh, the model um, of uh, uh, sort of that, that Tange proposed for the development of, of Tokyo, which actually um, in his writing about this work really incorporated a lot of the sort of organic metaphors that I think were influenced by his younger peers in the metabolist movement. Um, and, and this was an idea of a kind of mega structure which uh, would be placed over Tokyo Bay um, a, as a way for the city to expand. Again, sort of dealing with this kind of population pressure um, that was uh, threatening sort of the way of life of, of Tokyo at this time. Um, so, so Tange proposed moving over the bay, but not through traditional sort of infill um, uh, development, but actually by building this kind of megastructure, um, which would be this sort of lattice work of roads and then these sort of tent-like structures, which were themselves sort of artificial ground in which um, individual homes could be built inside of these kind of giant tents. Um, I, I say tent just because the, the building looks like a tent, but these sort of giant structures. Um, and, uh, and so this was uh, a, a proposal that was actually presented in a great deal of, of detail. It was presented, um, I believe the year 1960 uh, on the New Year's show on NHK. Um, so it was presented to the Japanese public with a lot of fanfare. Um, it was a plan with a lot of, uh, as I say, a lot of detail that, uh, that attracted a lot of attention worldwide um, from other architects um, and, and was quite controversial. Of course, it was, it was never implemented. 
But, um, but I argue in the book that, that Tokyo Bay itself, um, in many both sort of architectural works and, and science fiction works becomes the sort of locus of a, of a sort of imaginative territory of expansion in a sense uh, analogous to um, the, I, the way in which um, in American science fiction, outer space becomes a kind of um, imaginative uh, uh, canvas for you know, ideas and criticisms about American expansionism um, and American sort of manifest destiny. Um, so, um, so, uh, so I think this is very interesting and I don't have necessarily um, a ready-made answer for, for why Tokyo Bay has become such a imaginative uh, fixation. Um, although I do have a few, um, a few uh, hypotheses that I present in the book. Um, so uh, um, the, the second thing that I, I wanted to highlight is the theme of uh, capsules and um, the idea of cyborg architecture. So um, uh, among the works that are associated with metabolism that actually got built um, and actually, uh, at least for now, still survive, um, the most famous of these is the work um, called Nakagin Capsule Building, um, which is in Tokyo um, uh, near Ginza. And, um, and uh, still exists today, but this was a building that was built, um, it was sort of rapidly constructed from these prefabricated units, um, which had actually been fabricated in, in a facility um, designed to make uh, shipping containers. Um, and these um, units were then sort of plugged into, in a sense, um, this framework. So this idea sort of framework and, um, and sort of, uh, removable, addable units. Um, so the idea, even though in fact, the building was not terribly uh, modified or, 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 or did not really grow or shrink over the years, um, the idea behind the building was that um, it was sort of infinitely um, permeable and this infinitely permutations of the, of the building could be imagined. Um, so these units could be linked up to, to make a a larger housing suite, or um, you know, more units could be added on, or units could be removed and replaced when they got old. Um, so, so this was a sort of showcase of this idea, and um, Kurokawa, in particular, promoted this idea of the capsule as an architectural form. Mm. And uh, and when we look at the Osaka Expo, we see capsules all over the place, really uh, very much featured. For example, in the roof of the theme zone or in uh, Kiyo, uh, Kikutake's um, Expo Tower, these kind of um, polyhedron um, observation units, which are uh, connected to a central tower, um, or uh, Kurokawa's own work, uh, Takara Butilian, which I think is one of the most elegant of these structures, um, this sort of lattice work, um, which you can see has the potential for kind of expansion um, and then these capsules which fit into the lattice work. Um, and this whole notion of capsules was really highlighted in the um, Osaka Expo. So um, for example, you see here next to the Takara Butilian, a kind of architectural extension of this space were these sort of um, towers which look um, very much like, I, I, to, to my eye, like um, astronaut suits. Um, so the idea sort of connecting um, the capsule um, with the sort of capsule of a space, um, of, of a rocket, for example, of course, this is the era of the space race and the Apollo missions, um, and, or the idea of a, a space suit itself being a kind of wrapping, you know, around the human being, which is almost like a, a kind of architecture, a kind of capsule. Um, or, uh, and we also have, you know, within the sort of display space of the expo um, things which are um, sort of uh, drawing the connection between the kind of capsule form and the human womb um, and, and embryo as uh, again, the sort of organic metaphor of, 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 a, of a capsule. Um, so sort of looking at various uh, kind of definitions among uh, folks affiliated with the um, with the metabolist movement um, of this idea of 
capsules, um, you know, some things that really stand out to me are this idea of kind of enclosure and this idea that the human being needs to be kind of protected in a sense that this enclosure is something which maintains a kind of homostasis um, that is a sort of equilibrium within uh, which is sort of um, re interacting with the environment, but at the same time protecting the inhabitant from the environment. Um, and, uh, and this is a sort of um, a concept from cybernetics, uh, which, and, and we see a sort of cybernetic vocabulary very much influencing this conception of capsule as it was introduced um, at the Osaka World's Fair, for example. Um, so we see, uh, and Kurokal himself called the capsule cyborg architecture. Um, and he talks about the capsule as a node in an information network, um, a point from which to filter information from outside and even sort of barter what he called creative information from the inhabitants. Um, so this is a kind of point in a network, right? Um, and another interesting thing about um, the conception of capsules at the time is the emphasis on mobility. Um, the idea that, uh, you know, as, as we said in the Nakagin capsule tower, the capsule could be removed um, or, you know, that, that the frame itself could, could um, change shape. And so that this is a sort of um, metaphor for an architecture, which is sort of transforming and in a sense mobile, but there was an imagination that um, that the capsule could become even more mobile and that perhaps it could free itself from that frame. Um, and, and then, then uh, and Kurokawa imagined the sort of docking, um, what, what he calls a docking of multiple capsules in kind of flexible social aggregations as a kind of new conception of architecture for the future. Um, and Kurokawa uh, also emphasized sort of customization um, that these uh, capsules could be mass produced, but in a sense they could be sort of customized by um, their inhabitants. Mm. So, um, and uh, one thing that I, again, this is my own sort of uh, um, interpretation that I, I think is, is in a sense sort of a speculative um, that is not um, within sort of mainstream literature of, um, of capsules, but personally sort of looking at science fiction and capsule design from this time, I'm really intrigued by this relationship between the fact that uh, the Nakagin uh, capsule tower was created in 1972, and this is the same year as the, um, the first piloted robot series, uh, Manzinger, Manzinger Z um, uh, from 1972. And, uh, and those of you who are familiar with Japanese popular culture and science fiction um, know that this sort of piloted robot is, is, has become a very sort of um, signature element of, of many anime and Japanese science fiction. Um, and, uh, and in fact, a kind of predecessor from this ex existed at the 1970 Osaka Expo designed by Tange's uh, former students, uh, Isozaki Arata, um, as a kind of piloted uh, performance assistant in the festival plaza. But in any case, I think that this idea of a, of a cyborg and a, the capsule as a sort of cyborg architecture um, is a sort of interesting connection from, with this and this sort of emphasis of mobility and architecture, interesting connection to um, the emergence of the sort of mecha um, or the, the piloted robot um, form. Okay. Um, and the last of these themes that I wanted to mention um, is the idea of apocalypse. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, Komatsu Sakyo's two big narratives, Virus and Japan Sinks, as being you know, large scale sort of apocalyptic narratives. Um, but we also see within the, um, the, uh, the metabolist architects and their writings and, and folks who are sort of connected loosely um, with uh, metabolism such as Isozaki Arata, who was an architect um, disciple of, uh, Ken, uh, of Tange, um, did not participate in the um, 1960 Metabolist Manifesto and maintained some kind of critical distance from the group, but nevertheless was an important kind of interlocutor um, of the group. And, um, and he in particular focused on this sort of idea of the ruins 
and ruins not only as, as a sort of memory, in a sense, a cultural memory of Japanese cities that had only 15 years earlier been destroyed, you know, in many cases leveled to the ground by firebombs, or in the case of Hiroshima and Nagasaki by atomic bombs, um, but also sort of ruins as a kind of future potential for the Japanese city um, as part of a kind of cyclical apocalyptic imagination. Um, so uh, going back to um, the Metabolist Manifesto, we have Kawazoe um, writing, um, we hope to create something which even in destruction will cause a subsequent new creation. Um, and then we have Isozaki, as I mentioned, um, returning to this idea of the ruin. Um, this is an early example where he actually combines his own sort of um, utopian megastructure design of uh, a city in the air Shinjuku um, with uh, these forms of kind of classical ruins um, in his kind of imaginative work. And uh, another sort of somewhat later a version of this is a, a photo montage that he exhibited in Milan um, that uh, um, show that was entitled Hiroshima ruined again in the future. And we see these kind of mega structures um, on the horizon that are like ruins of mega structures. Um, and, uh, and Isozaki writes, incubated cities are designed to self-destruct. Ruins are the style of our future cities. Future cities are themselves ruins. For our contemporary cities, for this reason, we are destined to live only a fleeting moment, um, give up their energy and return to inert material. All of our proposals and efforts will be buried. And once again, the incubation mechanism is reconstituted. That will be the future. So the future city as ruin and the ruin as the destiny of the future city, but itself then becoming an incubation uh, bed. Uh, I think a really interesting um, idea and one that is very um, resonant, I think, in, 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 and interesting to think about in terms of both architecture and fiction. Mm. So um, uh, Isozaki in sort of pointing out his um, sort of distance from the metabolist says, I was in agreement with most of what they said, but I could not see eye to eye on one cardinal point, drawing a direct analogy between organic metabolism and architectural composition. For rather than being systemic, change is dramatic and destructive, lying outside the bounds of human control. It is the result of complicated accumulations of overlapping, unforeseeable coincidences. Um, and in the second chapter of my book, I discuss this uh, con concept of ruins and particularly the resonances that this work has with a kind of apocalyptic science fiction and writing of Komatsu Sakyo, who I mentioned before, the author of Virus, the author of um, uh, Japan Sinks, and the author of another work called the, the Japan Apache Tribe, which even more sort of thematizes ruins um, and the sort of constructive, uh, but sort of crazy apocalyptic kind of constructive energy of ruins. Um, and, uh, and Komatsu also kind of wrote about extensively about um, the, Im the importance of sort of witnessing, eyewitnessing sort of Japanese cities ruined and flattened um, and society in a sense brought to a zero point um, after, you know, at, at the end of World War II um, as a kind of formative experience. Um, and this is something that kind of connects um, Komatsu and Isozaki. And so I don't have time to talk uh, in detail about that, but, but this is one of the um, ideas that I explore. Mm. Okay, so I'm gonna skip a little bit about Komatsu and, and just um, at the end here, um, just talk a little bit about how some of these themes um, I, I also see sort of echoing. Um, so uh, Komatsu's work uh, that I've described a lot of it really um, comes from the same period of, of the metabolist um, movement. And uh, Komatsu himself, as we saw, was a collaborator with the, the metabolist architects. Um, but I see other um, science fiction creators, particularly um, the, the filmmakers, um, the anime artists, uh, Otomo Katsuhiro, um, famous for the work Akira, 
And um, Oshi Mamoru, famous for Ghost in the Shell, but also for Pet Labor. Um, so I see these as artists of a slightly later generation, but who still sort of reflect, in some cases, criticize um, some of the themes of, of metabolism. Um, so uh, with regard to, to Akira, um, those of you who are familiar with the, the, the anime, it's hard to forget the opening scene. Um, we see a sort of bird's eye view of Tokyo. Um, we see the, the actual year of the release of the film sort of being given as the date um, of this, uh, of, the, of, the, of the scene starting. And then we see on the horizon, this giant fireball sort of engulfing the city of, of Tokyo. And this has become sort of, in a sense, um, the supernova that, that unleash the sort of energy of, 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 of anime onto the world. Um, and, and, and this has become such an iconic scene in, in animation history. Um, but, uh, but I'm sort of interested in this sort of narratologically as, as the fact that this is the beginning. It's not the end of Akira, but this is the beginning. Um, and the rest of the film sort of describes uh, the sort of life on the sort of the ruins of, of the old Tokyo, as well as the Tokyo that has been rebuilt, right? So the, the, the series actually takes place um, in the film version, it takes place in 2019. And, um, and Tokyo, as, as you may recall, has been um, rebuilt as Neo-Tokyo. And again, the sort of imagination of Tokyo, future of Tokyo being Tokyo Bay. So we see here, Neo-Tokyo is really built um, uh, across uh, Tokyo Bay as a new city. Um, and then we see sort of the ruins of the older city also playing a role in the film and in the manga, which was a work, um, uh, the sort of comic strip um, that was uh, um, Old Tomo also sort of drew um, uh, sort of uh, at the same time or slightly before, but also while he was um, making uh, the, the film, anime film Akira. So, um, so this is one thing I think very interesting. And not only do we see the sort of ruins come into play, but the potential that this apocalypse itself can reoccur at any moment. Um, and in fact, in the manga version, it, it reoccurs. There's a second apocalypse that occurs sort of midway through the narrative. Um, so this idea that apocalypse is it's itself kind of a cycle. Um, and, and one of the things that intrigues me about Akira, um, both the film and the manga, is that it is, to my, um, to, in my opinion, it's, um, it sort of conceptualizes um, Japanese history as a kind of cycle, right? And, and a kind of apocalyptic cycle. But we also see sort of many sort of historical elements. Um, so we see, you know, in addition to this kind of echo that we have of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and that fireball that we see in the opening scene, um, we also see echoes of student protests from the 1960s, millennial movements from the end of the 19th century, um, revolutionary movements from the 1930s or the 1960s, um, ineffectual civil, civilian government and an activist military that is redolent of the militarist period um, leading into World War II. Um, and, and, and also the, the today of the 1980s of Japan, you know, in the form of this sort of um, delinquent youth biker culture. Um, so, uh, so all these kind of historical elements are kind of mixed together. And um, um, some, for example, the, uh, the film scholar Isolde Standish has have referred to this as a kind of postmodernist view of history in which history is a kind of flattening out. Um, all these historical things are kind of jumbled up together in a pastiche. Um, and, and this is a kind of postmodern flattening of history. But I would like to argue that this is actually a kind of cyclical view of history in which um, we are sort of destined to kind of repeat the same history in this kind of secular fashion. And I think nowhere more so does it, is this evident in the fact the film's kind of invocation of the Tokyo Olympics and the idea of a kind of Olympic time as secular time. Um, and, and you may recall that, the, that this film from 1988 kind of um, weirdly uh, sort of predicted the, um, the scheduling of the next Tokyo Olympics for 2020, 
Um, but, uh, but at the same time, all of these apocalyptic events are happening around the Olympics. So it's unclear whether the Olympics are actually gonna be able to be held because we have um, this sort of site of warfare between sort of telekinetic children who are with their sort of mental powers um, capable perhaps of, of destroying the entire city of Tokyo again. So it might not, not be such a great time for an Olympics. Um, and we see in the film uh, something which had became the sort of viral last year um, as, as Tokyo was wavering over whether to um, host the Olympics um, last summer in the midst of the coronavirus. And, um, and this sort of one frame of Akira from, um, from Akira showed uh, the fictional late like, 2020 Olympics and the graffiti on the, on the bottom right there says, chushi da chushi or um, just cancel it. <laughs> and this became a kind of rallying cry um, among some on the internet, like just cancel it. So, um, so we'll see what happens uh, with the now postponed Olympics. Um, but, uh, but we see the sort of uh, certainly a kind of weird uh, prophetic power of this particular work. Um, uh, the other um, uh, series that I would like to mention just as we're coming to the conclusion here is, is the Pad Labor series by Oshi. And um, here, uh, again, we see the imagination of a sort of expansion over Tokyo Bay. The theme, one of the main themes of the series is the so-called Project Babylon, in which the entire sort of uh, Bay of Tokyo is going to be sort of dammed and controlled by a series of sluices. And, and the, the sort of water level will be decreased and Tokyo Bay will be capable of, uh, of this giant ex uh, expansion doubling of the uh, of the of of the um, square mileage of of the city and and meanwhile you know older buildings we see throughout this uh, work are being torn down um, and they're torn down by this these piloted robots which in this series are called labors um, so we see this sort of imagination of the future in which is kind of new form of um, combination of human and machine. Is in, in itself a sort of element, a sort of architectural protagonist, right? A, a sort of uh, creator of uh, and destroyer of, of architecture. Um, and and the uh, the title, however, the pat labor derives from uh, another type of labor, um, so-called labor uh, uh, piloted robots, um, which are patrol labors. There 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 are police labors um, because uh, many of these labors are sort of prone to glitches. And hijacking and 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 other um, sort of um, um, cyber attacks, and so um, so the, there's a police force of of pat labors which also tries to keep these rogue elements in in rain, um, and uh, and nevertheless we see in the film the sort of discourse of the sort of new Tokyo that's being constructed versus the sort of ruins of an, of an older to Tokyo, the rubble that's sort of left in its wake. Um, and, uh, and I would argue that this film actually represents a departure from the sort of generative, sort of almost positive, apocalyptic, but yet energetic um, potential of, of ruins that we saw, I think both in Akira and also in the works of such as um, the Japan Apache tribe, um, by Komatsu Sakyo. Um, and and um, so I see in, in Oshi, we see a kind of requiem in a sense for the older neighbors of Tokyo, which are going to be destroyed by the pat labors and by this giant project Babylon. And I see this as a kind of um, critique in a sense of the sort of what's sometimes referred to as the construction state on um, this idea that, you know, these large scale state projects um, as well, uh, which are sort of transforming Japan throughout post-war history, um, but also a critique of sort of architectural practices known as scrap and build, um, in which, you know, older buildings are sort of heartlessly, um, you know, obviously that's a editorialization, but are sort of ripped down um, to, to create new buildings. And, um, and we can see other critics from around the same time or other artists sort of um, articulating similar kind of critiques of what was happening to the Japanese city in the 1980s in terms of, in a sense, the metabolism of the city sort of revving up again um, and the changing in this, of the city um, um, 
uh, growing in, in scale. So, uh, so another artist, a photographer, uh, Miyamoto Ryuji, who, who wrote about ruins and took photographs of ruins at this time, um, writes, um, this kind of change occurred at the time of the Tokyo Olympics, 1964, but it would seem that the process was accelerated in the 1980s. The harbor was completely occupied, the highways ran above ground, the newly developed city center bristled with skyscrapers. At the same time, old buildings with extensions and many different facades, a large number of brick buildings downtown, erected at the beginning of the Showa period, and the sheet copper-sided homes and apartment buildings were all torn up by their roots. Everywhere the streets were different, made new, everything was subordinated to efficiency and perverted into a colorless space. Inconvenient old buildings were replaced with astounding speed. There was no time for them even to fall into decay. Ruins were not left around for very long. So I think we see, you know, in Miyamoto's work and Oshii's work, in works also by um, uh, Fuji Mori Terunobu and As Akasegawa Genpei, who are affiliated with a group called the Street Observation Studies Group, um, a kind of discourse, a kind of discursive network of, of ruins an, an elegiac discourse of ruins, um, which I think is uh, is in contrast to the earlier um, generative view of ruins that we saw kind of proposed by the, the metabolist movement. Um, and, and here we even see uh, what looks like in a sense a, a quote, those of you who are familiar with Akasegawa Genpei's work, um, in particular his, his photographs, which he called Thomason's, of sort of vestiges, strange vestiges of old buildings left in the kind of ruins of transforming Tokyo. Um, we see a kind of echo of that even in Oshii's uh, work, Pat Labor. Um, so uh, let's see, we're, we're definitely uh, running short on time here. Um, the other thing which I, I, I guess I could address more in the, in the questions and answers is, um, it's interesting in Pat Labor Two, um, we have a um, we have a, a, a focus on actually um, on the cyborg side of uh, of things, and and we we see a focus on um, on the Pat Labor these these sort of uh, mobile police or piloted robots as a kind of nodes in an information network, but an information network which is kind of constructing a hyper-reality in which you, you can't tell the difference between news and not news or war and simulated warfare. Um, and so we see a kind of media um, critique of a kind of hyper-reality um, in the second film in the Pat Labor series, which I think addresses um, some of the issues, um, you know, which were proposed in a more utopian fashion by Kurokawa in his capsule declaration. Um, I think we see, again, a more kind of critical view of these, in a sense, in Oshii's work. Um, so I think that I'm going to stop there because I wanna leave some time for questions and answers. And um, uh, there's, there's much more I could have said, but hopefully we can get to a few things in the um, discussion. So I'm gonna stop my slides and Hopefully Helen can come back up. Hello again. Thanks, Will. <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, that was great. That was a really fantastic um, visual uh, start to our 2021 year. And I was, as someone who's lived in Osaka twice and thinks of Osaka as uh, her Japanese hometown and has walked past that 1970 Expo Tower a lot, it was really lovely to see it, particularly as we can't all travel to Japan at the moment. <laughs> But it was also somewhat disturbing to mm -hmm. uh, see uh, the mention of the virus movie and mm -hmm. and uh, the mention or the prediction of Tokyo 2020 being cancelled and and sort of feel sitting here in 2021 that we might be descending into some kind of science fiction mm -hmm. uh, world. But anyway, hopefully we'll come out the other side. But I just personally wanted to ask mm -hmm. one question before I start to look at the chat. And just a reminder sure. to everybody, can you put... Uh, can you please type all your questions into the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of your screens? I can see some questions are coming in now, so I'll, I'll get to those in a minute. Um, I've, I've looked at the Tokyo 1964 Olympics myself from the perspective mm -hmm. of sports history and social history, but not from the perspective of architecture. But I do know that Tung, um, Tungay 
mm -hmm. designed the Yoyogi National Gymnasium for the Olympics. And so That's you right. did talk about the Olympics a little bit mm -hmm. at the end, but can you talk us through whether there was any uh, interaction and influence between the fact that, you know, there was a lot of investment in architecture for the staging of the Olympics mm -hmm. and to what extent that the metabolist movement you're talking about had any mm -hmm. influence on that architecture or not? Sure. Yeah, um, that's, that's a great question. And I, I think um, definitely there are all sorts of historical connections here, um, Atange himself being being one of them. Um, but I, I think, you know, again, I I had to sort of cut a lot of corners in the talk, but, but one of the things that sort of key background information is the sense that um, Tokyo was a, was, a, was a city and the Japanese, you know, archipelago as a whole were being uh, rapidly transformed during this period. Um, so this is a period of sort of great infrastructure projects, um, highways being built, um, you know, mountains being moved, rivers being dammed, um, but, but also, uh, you know, the construction of the Shinkansen, you know, which opened, as you know, you know, in, 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 in tandem with the Tokyo Olympics, the construction of um, the Haneda Airport um, and 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 the monorail for that. Um, so uh, and also the construction of the sort of highway, elevated highway system, which really uh, which really for better and for worse transformed um, the city of Tokyo greatly. Um, so this it was a I think it was a moment, you know, and and of course Tange in designing the Yoyogi Stadium participated in this um, in a very prominent way. And it was a reclamation of the, of the city also, the Yoyogi National um, Stadium was built on the site of um, one of the sort of housing facilities for the allied occupation and, mm -hmm. and, and sort of an American <clears throat> village that was kind of torn down, um, you know, in time for the Olympics. So it was a kind of handover moment in a sense, um, but, uh, but also a sense in which you know that that there was a potential to kind of reimagine and 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 recreate Japanese cities, which had emerged sort of in the early post-war era, just kind of pell-mell, um, you know, from the ruins of the fire bombs, um, and um, with with not a whole lot of sort of centralized planning. Mm -hmm. So um, so the metabolist, I, I think, emerged at a time when there was. Um, when there was a call for sort of greater thought about the planning process. Um, and in a sense, the protagonists, the metabolists sort of propose themselves as participants in this sort of let's go back to square one and kind of reimagine how we think about change and growth in cities and what are the potentials of our city. Um, and they propose themselves to sort of take place part in that sort of um, recreation of, of, of Japan to sort of mix success. Of course, like Tange being such a prominent architect was involved, um, you know, quite extensively in, in various projects. Kurokawa became involved in a number of think tanks um, that had sort of semi-government, you know, um, uh, uh, connections. But, but their big sort of utopian designs were never really realized. Yeah. Um, and instead, we have this sort of you know, in a sense, the construction state, you know, continuing to work and continuing to involve sort of more, you know, street level sort of contractors, um, you know, in, in a very sort of, you know, kind of straightforward sort of de developmental economics and, um, and a system. So, so that, that's the sort of, you know, kind of construction state system that I think Oshi is criticizing. Um, the metabolists, in a sense, offered an alter alternative version of that, um, you know, one which was still very large scale and still to a large degree top down, even though they imagined the potential for sort of change and adaptation within it, rather than saying everything has to be designed by, by a single sort of master planner, mm. right? So, um, yeah, and then of course the 1970 Osaka Expo is a sort of bookend for the Olympics yeah. Um, this idea that that we will bring the same sort of state redevelopment dollars, you know, to the Osaka region, and create new infrastructure, um, clean up things, um, it's and promote Osaka in the same way that that Tokyo was promoted um, in the Olympics, and and we have obviously the echo of that in the in the fact that there is a an Osaka new Osaka Expo being planned um, 
to uh, to sort of follow the the um, supposed Tokyo Olympics <laughs> that are happening uh, have been rescheduled for the summer. Yeah. Great. Well, we'll have to see how that all pans out, won't we? Right, I'm yeah. going to go into the Q&A uh, function. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have a question here from Raymond Sweetman of UCL. He mm -hmm. says, um, well, he asked, was any consideration given to the detritus of these visions? So mm -hmm. building rubble, et cetera, sewage, waste disposal. And in terms of regeneration, were they envisaged as infinite or finite models of architecture? Hmm. Well, I think certainly sort of conceptually sort of detritus, you know, um, certainly in the works of, of Isozaki, this idea of ruins as being, you know, the city will sort of inevitably produce its own ruins and its own detritus is part of his conception. Um, and I think that implicitly the sort of organic metaphor of, of, of metabolism sort of invokes this idea of cells that are both sort of intaking new material and expelling sort of waste as part of their um, cycle of, of, of growth and generation and, and living. Um, in terms of the actual um, planning uh, of, of the cities and the buildings that were proposed, um, I, I don't think, I, I don't see a, a lot of emphasis on, on this question of, um, of, of waste, other than I could say that um, that Kikutake's conception that I, I showed of the, the tower-shaped community, in a sense, sort of um, was trying to deal with the fact that, well, the, the living units in an apartment building, you know, will, will eventually decay. Um, and, and so trying to build in that cycle of actually melting those down and replenishing them as a kind of form of recycling trying to build that into the building design. Um, but I think on a sort of street level version of, of like questions of sort of waste and pollution, one of the, certainly one of the criticisms was, that was leveled against metabolism was that um, even though it had this sort of idealistic vision of itself as in a sense responding to an environmental crisis, um, in fact, it was just a kind of version of scrap and build, right? <laughs> this idea that that um, you know that uh, imagining architecture as something which will be kind of thrown away and, and redone, um, and which will generate waste and be wasteful in the sense uh, in the sense that um, that we might you know um, criticize. So I think that 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 that, that was a, a charge against the sort of metabolist con conception that even though it had a kind of idealistic environmentalist um, side to it, in a sense, it was complicit with this kind of construction state and this kind of scrap and build mentality. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay, uh, great. Well, we have a couple of questions here, which mm -hmm. probably can be linked together. One from Patrick, mm -hmm. who asks, uh, what other architectural movements were occurring alongside the, the metabolists? Mm -hmm. and in what ways did they, you know, contrast with them? Mm -hmm. And one from Nikolai, I think, which could go along with that. Um, uh, what contemporary developments can be traced back to those metabolist ideas or projects? You know, did it inspire other movements in Japan or outside Japan? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think you know it's important not to just see Japan in 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 a bubble, right? And <laughs> and particularly architecture is a very in, international field, and all of these architects were very much in com constant communication with their peers in other countries, and we see sort of similar movements in, in other countries and similar kind of utopian move, you know, moments around 1960, where on the one hand, sort of um, centralized central planning is being criticized in a number of quarters. Um, so the idea of sort of international sort of Congress of architecture, you know, um, sort of these great sort of city planners, um, these sort of imagining sort of cities as this, these sort of perfect checkerboards and this sort of um, idea of, um, of city planning as a kind of rational thing where you will distribute, you know, various features of a city in various neighborhoods um, functions of a city sort of as kind of functionalism. Um, and uh, and that is um, that is something that uh, um, was happening. so that kind of criticism of of that that type of centralized planning 
was happening. And so architects were beginning to sort of imagine sort of similar versions of just building a framework and allowing, you know, uh, allowing things to happen more spontaneously around it. Um, so in the United Kingdom, uh, Archigram um, was a group of architects, you know, who were exploring some of these ideas. Um, Jonah Friedman in France, um, there were many architects sort of around the world who were kind of exploring similar ideas. Um, and at the same time, also, another aspect of this, which I, I didn't talk so much today about in, in my talk today was um, this idea of imagining architecture also as being uh, um, a kind of simulation and kind of open to uh, that architecture, you know, through information technology was becoming more flexible, you know, so thinking of organic growth as something that's that 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 is not only sort of within building materials, but also the sort of orga organicism of um, information technology as information as being mm. something fluid, right? And so the information technology transforming the city into something which is liquid and fluid and sort of this imagination of of, of the sort of, mo of, of the city of the future as being um, one transformed by uh, by information technology. So that is something that I think, you know, that is something Isozaki wrote about quite a bit in, in very interesting ways. Um, and, uh, and I have a chapter where I talk about sort of connections between science fiction and, um, and architecture in terms of their imagination of this sort of cy cybernetic cities or sort of liquid cities. And, and that is something I think, you know, in terms of the, um, uh, the legacy of metabolism, right? So the, the idea of this sort of like frames and capsules has not really taken off um, globally, I, I think we can say um, a, as an architectural idiom, um, but, but the idea of sort of imagining cities in flux and planning for cities in flux and planning through cities kind of through simulation and through information technology um, and the ideas of, of in fact making the cities more organic, more flexible um, and even incorporating organic material into building material, for example, these are ideas which are still you know, very much being explored by architects today. Um, and so I think that there is, is still a, a dialogue that's going on with metabolism with respect to organicism and information technology, even if, um, even if in some ways that the, the things like the uh, Nakagin capsule tower are seen, you know, as a kind of historical curiosity, but, but not necessarily something which um, led to a, a new way of building um, in, uh, on a large scale. Thanks. I, I think you've sort of started to answer quite a few. We've got quite a few questions coming in asking mm -hmm. about this legacy of metabolism and, you know, how it can be reinterpreted mm -hmm. um, today. And, and in particular, one question, so quite a few questions along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, and one question from Stefan here, who has mm -hmm. read your article, Narratives of Collapse and Generation. He says you're quite critical of the techno utopian depiction of the ideas of the metabolists in that, but at the same time, you know, you're capturing that in your book. Um, so uh, he's saying, in the same way that all science fiction is not only dystopic, but it sometimes offers a glimmer of hope. Mm -hmm. uh, so where do you, what, what ideas of the metabolist movement do you think are worth holding on to after 60 years? Um, mm. So again, that sort of hinting at the legacy, or I don't know if you want to say more about that kind of legacy or? Right, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, I, I guess I try to explore in the book. I mean, I do think that um, a, another, another aspect that I, I discuss, again, I didn't have time so much today, but within those apocalyptic narratives, we see some of the first sort of globally, some of the first sort of um, uh, narratives that are addressing climate change. Um, so I, I believe from even uh, 1962, there was a, one of the metabolist critics, um, Kawazoe, wrote about, um, wrote a sort of um, narrative uh, of sort of architectural future where he imagined Tokyo eventually being uh, 
um, subsumed by the Pacific Ocean due to climate change um, and anthropogenic climate change. So, so and and that was uh, anthropogenic climate change was another big theme of Komatsu Sakyo, um, although it's sort of buried in in his fictional works. Um, but uh, but I, I do think that um, that so sort of attention, you know, the, the sort of whole way of thinking about architecture and cities as a narrative process where we can think about our sort of feedback loops in a sense with the natural world and the potential for disasters and the way in which we may be able to um, rebound from disasters. Um, so I do see, you know, on, on the one hand, um, uh, there's a lot to be worried about in terms of the future, which um, which these works point out. But I do see, you know, in that very sort of engagement with um, imagination of the future and sort of, you know, uh, addressing some of these serious questions, um, uh, I, I do see a um, a positive potential in you know both the the architecture and the science fiction works. Mm. Mm. And um, a question here from Jacob asking, mm -hmm. um, would you like to give us a hypothesis regarding the prominence of Tokyo Bay in imagining the future mm -hmm. of Tokyo? I mean, again, the Olympics 2020 plays into this perhaps, but. Right, uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Olympics 2020 are definitely, Tokyo Bay is, is very much featured. Um, so Tokyo Bay has always been sort of the site of the future in some way, right? Um, and, and, and if we think, of Odaiba, uh, those of you who are familiar with Tokyo, the, the Odaiba has this kind of futuristic um, uh, quality to, to the sort of self-presentation of the city. Um, and uh, it's the, uh, the home of the sort of Museum of uh, Future Technology. It's um, the Fuji television headquarters designed by Tange, a kind of echo, a kind of metabolist a megastructure building. So we see, um, we see the, Tokyo Bay is a kind of stage for the future. Um, I, I guess one one hypothesis that I do develop, uh, you know, do discuss in the in the book is is the idea that um, we can see uh, if we look at science fiction in Japan, the sort of pre-war years, the kind of proto science fiction, we see the Pacific as a sort of expansion, like the Pacific as the sort of arena of Japanese imperial expansion, right? So this is the era of imperialism um, and the idea and, and sort of promotion of Japanese sort of technological spirit across the Pacific, you know, um, in the form, you know, of, of, of um, you know, Japanese warships, you know, on, on the one hand, but, uh, but you know, we can, we can see that the, um, uh, the, 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 that, the sort of expansion over the ocean as being a sort of imaginative territory of, of Japanese imperialism, which is then sort of cut short or, you know, has to be um, reimagined in the post-war era in which Japan has lost its empire and has, um, has renounced militarism, um, yet it, it's still, uh, and so I see in, in a sense um, Tokyo Bay as a kind of replacement um, for this kind of Trans-Pacific um, imaginary um, sort of imperialist vision of, of expansion. Um, you know, perhaps that is that it, that is one hypothesis that you could you could explore. But um, but if uh, if folks who are participating in this have other ideas, I, I would certainly mm -hmm. love to to hear them. Um, we have a question here about um, whether you could comment a bit more about how the architects and the authors that you mentioned mm -hmm. envisage the reci reciprocal relationship between the inhabitants of the city and mm -hmm. their designs, whether real or, or fictional. Mm -hmm. um, and somebody else was asking a question which might tie into that about the buildings that you mentioned that are still mm -hmm. around today. What are they used for? And are they are they is that sort of what they were designed or envisaged for or, mm -hmm. or not? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question, you know, and one thing that I, I, I see um, a little bit in, you know, it's uh, in a lot of the writings of architects, there's not a whole lot of space given for sort of imagining the individual and the imagine individual's life um, so much as 
sort of we talk about sort of future kind of conditions of the individual and the subjectivity of the individual, but sort of imagining what actual life in such a building, you know, would be like, um, and what you know, what happens when like actual life is messy, right? And, and people's interactions with buildings and cities are not necessarily so utopian, right? When we get to the level of sort of nitty gritty everyday life. Um, and, and I do feel like there is a little bit of a lacuna, you know, in a sense of a lot of these works don't sort of imagine that, um, that sort of granular level of, of interaction. Um, until really, I, I think, again, um, we can look at a work like Oshie's Pat Labor, you know, and, and a sense at least of, of um, you know, in the first Pat Labor film, you know, the, the antagonist of the film is someone who is, who has moved, you know, from, from place to place in these old city, build, older city buildings that are being torn down by, um, by this giant construction project. Um, and, and he becomes sort of embittered towards the Project Battle Babylon and tries to sabotage it. Um, and the so-called heroes of this, of, of, of this work are the, the police, um, he's sort of manning these pat, futuristic pat labors who have to sort of tame this threat. But there's a great deal of sort of sympathy being you know, expressed in the film to the sort of subjectivity of, of this person who is being sort of dis constantly displaced by this process of architectural transformation. So I think that's, that's, that's one place we can see the more sort of individual level on a kind of critical level um, being addressed uh, in the works. Um, th and there was a second part to your question, which I think I've, I've, I've neglected. I just, it was just to do with um, the buildings that are still, that were built and are still oh, around. Yes, yeah, so that's quite interesting. Um, so, so the Nakagin um, Tower, for example, is quite interesting case and um, in the sense that it has, uh, it has largely deteriorated um, and it has not been particularly kept uh, kept with care over the years. Um, but it's, it's, it's a space in which um, artists and young people have sort of um, inhabited and transformed. Um, and so you can find um, there are books and documentaries out there that sort of um, explore the insides, you know, of, of the Nakagin um, tower and how people have turned those spaces into their own um, and how, uh, and we see, uh, you know, both of the sort of deterioration of, of that architectural space, but the way in which it's been kind of appropriated by its users. Um, again, and, and so that's something I think very interesting to, to observe and, um, and there are sort of books out there um, where you can, uh, you can explore <clears throat> that. Um, and uh, at the same time, there's been quite a bit of controversy over whether this building will be um, saved, will it be somehow restored? Um, will it be torn down? Um, so, so the fate of that, um, that particular building has been much discussed in the last um, 10 years or so. Yeah. Um, well, that kind of leads nicely into the next themes that are emerging. So mm -hmm. there's a few questions here talking about the fact that destruction and rebirth seems to be mm -hmm. quite a prevalent theme. Um, and um, linking it to religion and natural disasters. So Liam, for example, asks, um, for example, at a, at a religious level, the Issei Shrine is rebuilt every two, 20 years, sorry. Um, yeah. Would it be possible to say that the concept of inevitable architectural ruin and then rebirth as something organic is rooted in Japanese history, religion, and perhaps the constant reality of natural disaster as well? Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> excuse me, yes, um, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, I, I, and I appreciate that question. I think that, that the question itself um, uh, makes a couple of points which I think are, are very um, ne necessary and pertinent in, in that um, I think that certainly the conceptual background of metabolism uh, that the architects were very aware of the, the precedent, for example, of the Issei Shrine, even though they may not have wanted to highlight that for sort of questions because of, of the controversy of of, uh, of Issei Shrine and other buildings as, um, as, as representatives of a problematic sort of um, historic and cultural tradition and, and sort of nationalist um, ideas in architecture. So I, I think that, um, that the metabolists were very much uh, aware of this sort of precedent. And for example, Kikutake, 
one of the architects that I, I um, mentioned in my talk, um, he himself was, uh, was trained in a more traditional Japanese architecture, uh, you know, in which uh, um, architectural components are sort of standardized, um, such as tatami mats or shoji doors, um, and can and have a kind of replacement cycle, right? So that, 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 that a Japanese, a traditional building has a kind of framework in terms of the, of the frame of the building and components which, which have a replacement cycle, which is not the same as the building. So in a sense, they are metabolist, right? They, they are sort of, you know, before the fact metabolism. And, and so metabolist, in a sense, I think was trying to, the movement was trying to connect to the Japanese architectural tradition um, and also to the conditions of Japan as being a country struck by natural disasters frequently, frequently destroyed and rebuilt. Um, it's sort of, uh, I think, um, addressing that um, historical condition and that historical, the, the tradition of Japanese architecture, but trying to reimagine it on a conceptual level rather than quoting, you know, architectural, you know, rather than incorporating architecture history by quotation um, in terms of the style of the buildings, um, sort of using that um, sort of conceptual elements of, of Japanese architectural practice as, a, as an inspiration for their architecture. Um, and, uh, and then you can also get to Kurokawa, um, for example, writes um, about um, metabolism as a kind of Buddhist um, practice, right? So this idea of, of impermanence, right? Um, so he explicitly in, in some of his writings, you know, um, does sort of connect it with that religious and aesthetic tradition of, of Buddhism, of impermanence, of a cyclical conception of time. So, um, so certainly the, the metabolist architects themselves were aware of those um, connections with the cultural past, but at the same time, they sort of, I, I think they tried to highlight their, their kind of future, futurism, right? Um, not, not present themselves as traditionalists, but, but sort of inspired on the conceptual level by, by some of those um, uh, practices. Um, Joanna wants to know if you've seen the book, Anime Architecture. Um, yeah, I, I will certainly check that out. Thank you. Okay, right. Yeah. Um, there's a question here about mm -hmm. um, from James, I think, about transportation. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. architecture has to cope with forms of transport, future transport. Mm -hmm. um, so are these futuristic projects adapted well to, you know, you know, in terms of what are the links and images of transportation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, certainly, um, I think uh, in, in terms of the metabolist architect, um, or, or actually metabolism was a group which incorporated, um, you know, both uh, um, architects and designers. Um, and uh, so um, I, if you look at the 1970 Osaka Expo, certainly sort of the transportation infrastructure was very much part of the conception of that space, right? And, and it was a kind of, um, if Tangi, for example, imagined the uh, the sort of um, uh, movement of people, you know, uh, around the uh, the the site of the Osaka Expo, it was anticipated, and in fact, did have a a record number of visitors, um, and and so the ability to sort of move people around that site um, was something that had to be incorporated both on the level of um, of the transportation infrastructure, um, which was uh, designed um, to, to, in terms of its stylistic components by another metabolist, Ekuan Kenji, a designer. Um, but, uh, but sort of conceptually this, um, and again, this is, this is starting to talk about the, the conception of the future city as a cybernetic city. Right, so the ability to sort of take in information about the number of visitors and where they needed to go, um, and to to plan the sort of information infrastructure and the transportation infrastructure together, 
right? And to make this a city which would be adaptive to, to crowds and the movement of crowds and flexible to that, this is part of the conception of the, of the 1970 Expo. So I think, you know, if we talk and, and certainly um, things like um, the 1960 um, plan for Tokyo proposed by Tange Kenzo, I, I, you saw the picture of him standing in front of that, that big map of Tokyo. That is, is another um, example where this sort of transportation infrastructure is really part of the architectural conception. Um, and so, I, I, again, we have a connection here between transportation and information um, and, and sort of the ability to change um, and adapt in kind of feedback loops, which is, which is, is um, informing the, the conceptions of, of both the Tokyo Bay proposal and, and especially the Osaka Expo. Thanks. Um, we have an interesting question here from Hester. He says mm -hmm. the um, high rises of science fiction classics like Metropolis are often interpreted as critiques of class division. Mm -hmm. Did the metabolists imagine their architecture as spaces to create a more equal society, for example, or was mm -hmm. this not part of the Japanese discussion? So asking about class. Yeah, yeah that's really interesting. Um, certainly we see that uh, absolutely that, that, that class critique in um, Metropolis and other, um, other science fiction works. Um, I would say uh, one interesting place to look for this is Kurokawa's writing about the capsule form. Kurokawa himself had a sort of, again, almost utopian conception of architecture and sort of society transforming in tandem. Um, and he talked about the capsule form as a kind of liberation in the sense of the individual. Um, so he, he saw that the individual would inhabit a capsule and uh, and then would have um, would have the prerogative to sort of dock with other individuals to create families or not, um, and and so he you know, explicitly in, in some of his writing um, sort of offers this as an alternative to the kind of patriarchal construction of, of Japanese society, um, and so I do I do think that 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 there is a sort of social utopian element. Um, to, to Kurokawa's writing. Um, at the same time, I think that there is uh, often a, um, a neglect of, of class issues, a neglect of gender issues um, that we see in metabolist writing and in a lot of uh, science fiction writing from that same time period. Um, so I think that there are a lot of blind spots um, in, in the work as well. Um, but uh, uh, and, and I think, you know, for example, in the work of Komatsu Sakyo, these sort of disaster narratives often, um, often kind of um, rely in a sense uh, for their ray of hope in the kind of resilience of very kind of patriarchal structures of, of um, sort of heroic scientists and, uh, and wise leaders who can somehow, um, who are almost always male, um, who who can somehow um, lead the the community or the nation through um, the uh, the trials of of whatever disaster is being featured? Um, so I think that kind of links to a question from Fabio, mm -hmm. my SOS mm -hmm. colleague, who says um, that he the thoughts about the capsule as architectural mm -hmm. reform uh, sorry form reminded him that Walter Benjamin. Um, described the 19th century interior as being like a velvet lined box in which the bourgeois owner rested a compass or another valuable instrument. Mm. So um, can we take that idea, the metabolist imagination of the capsule a bit further as, um, an, is it an extension of the body or clothing that can it become a protective shell, he's asking. I guess it kind of is different to the class question you just answered, but. Right. Um, yes, uh, absolutely. I, I think that this, um, and perhaps I wasn't able to uh, convey this um, as well as I might have in the talk, but I think one of the, one of the most interesting features of the capsule form is this idea of it as a kind of wrapping or clothing or protection. Um, and that's, um, that's, you know, that that sort of 
then begs the question, well, what, what, you know, a house is also kind of a shelter, right? <laughs> so why do we need a capsule? <laughs> like, why do we need that harder exterior in a sense, which, which has its sort of cybernetic link to the outside world, but, but is in a sense a more kind of protective shell. Um, and, and I think that, again, that sort of connects with the sort of anxieties of, the, of this time period with the Cold War, with, um, with the, uh, the increasing sort of attention to pollution and noise pollution in, in urban experience. Um, and so, so the need to, um, to not only have a sort of velvet lined box, <laughs> which I, I, I love that, that quote, but, but something which is a little bit more solid in a sense to, to protect the individual. Um, and then we see um, uh, later sort of um, versions of, of the metabolist capsule um, that I also discuss in the book, um, which uh, for example, the, the works of a kind of second generation architect, Ito Toyo, um, who was trained with, uh, um, Kiku Take, I believe. Um, and so he was very well versed in metabolism, metabolist architecture, but he tried to imagine architecture with kind of softer edges. And he talks about architecture as a kind of clothing. Um, so, uh, and architecture as a, as a membrane, which is also a membrane, an informational membrane, a, a membrane connecting us to this sort of information uh, um, of the outside informational sort of uh, environment of the outside world. Um, so we have a kind of continuation of that sort of cybernetic conception, but with more sort of an, an imagination of more sort of soft edges um, in, in Ito Toyo's work, who is a kind of second generation um, uh, architect sort of influenced by metabolism. I'm conscious of the time, so I'm just going to choose a, a couple mm -hmm. more questions. Um, there's a question here, for, uh, a comment here from Gala, who mm -hmm. says um, the 1960s were the years when more skyscrapers began to be built because the the um, uh, the legislate or the rules on on mm -hmm. height were lifted. So, right. to what extent do you think that the fascination with height influenced these imaginative reconstructions of the city? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just the idea of building up into the sky, you know, was was newly sort of possible in a sense by the by the changes in the building regulations, uh, as well as a number of other factors. But what I think what's what's interesting about metabolism is, it in a sense, addresses sort of be even beyond that. This, uh, if you, if you read the works of of architects of that era, there's a lot of kind of complaining in a sense about how sort of Byzantine the property ownership rules are, for example, in Tokyo, um, and, and how sort of difficult building kind of large scale structures is. Um, and so, um, so I think that, uh, for example, Isozaki Arata um, came up with this conception of, uh, of Shinjuku city in the air um, being uh, where you would build just these sort of large columns. And then he imagined building in a whole nother layer sort of connecting these columns on top of the existing city. <laughs> so sort of getting around all this question of like property rights and, um, and sort of needing to destroy the old city to build a new city actually mentioned like going above that, that ceiling, right? That old ceiling in, in which, uh, you know, in which um, you know, buildings were not allowed to be built ab above a certain height. Um, he built that sort of second city on top of that um, imaginatively in his proposal um, from around the year 1960, he built this, um, Im imagined this sort of second layer, which would be kind of put on these, um, these sort of concrete um, pillars as it were, um, that would, uh, would host a whole nother city on top of the existing city. So, so that, that, that is definitely, I think, a, a reaction um, uh, to uh, sort of the possibilities opened up by um, the, the changing um, regulations around uh, building height in, in Japan, in Tokyo. Mm. 
And finally, I, I, I mean, we have talked a little bit about legacy, but um, a more specific question here from a uh, colleague, mm. Donatella. Mm. Um, so what is the, looking back on the metabolist movement and thinking about contemporary Japanese architects and architecture today, what is the sort of major influence? Uh, and then perhaps link to that, just a, a sort of general question from a couple of people, what is the future of Japanese architecture and these kinds of visions? Mm -hmm. and positive positive or negative is one of the questions. <laughs> right. I mean, that's it's really <laughs> difficult for me to, um, yeah. to say, you know, beyond what, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not neither an architect nor an architectural historian, so oh, I, yeah. I can't... Um, I can't, you know, I, I can't predict. Um, I think a lot of architecture uh, of recent years has focused to, to a large degree on sort of smaller scale. You know, I think that there is a generation of architects who have, in a sense, reacted to metabolism by thinking small, you know, by thinking like, let's, let's think about how we can really create very sort of human scaled architecture in the small spaces that truly exist in a Japanese city. Um, so, and, and also thinking about um, architecture, which is more, um, has perhaps like a, a lighter footprint on the environment than, than previous uh, imaginations of, of building practices. So, um, so I think that there, there is a generation which, in a sense, reacts to metabolism, which, which is trying to be, um, trying to sort of remove that large scale vision and, and, and think of it and think of architecture in a different way. Um, you know, so I, I don't know, I, I think that architect, that it seems as if the metabolist architects are, um, are, uh, that, that there is a, and hopefully this book in some ways will be a part of it, there is a sort of um, impetus right now to take a second look at them and to, uh, to, to draw what inspiration or what, um, what lessons um, we can from their work um, in both a positive and a negative sense. Um, as I mentioned, I, I, I think that the two sort of most pertinent legacies, um, you know, one would be a kind of the, the metaphor of or organicism as it, as it regards the sort of interactions with the natural world um, and interactions with um, a world that is already in feedback loops with human beings, you know, through climate change. Um, so, so thinking about those kind of feedback loops and how architecture fits into that, I think that's one. And of course, the, um, the sort of cybernetic, the sort of um, the, the way in which it, the realm of information technology is is transforming our lives by the moments and and all the more so you know under under um, the pandemic and and the sort of ways in which our lives have been restructured by zoom for example um, and we're all sort of inhabiting imaginary spaces in a, in, a, in a new way you know in in the last couple of years right so so I think this idea of kind of virtual space, um, simulation, um, you know, through information technology, this idea of is, is architecture something which is only a physical thing or is it um, something which could be more ethereal in a sense. Um, I think that, the, that those, uh, those issues which were explored in the, in the early days by metabolists and other architects of the same time around the world, I think still have a lot of, a lot of legs to them. Great, thank you. Mm. Well, um, and speaking of visual space, I have to say that despite mm. the fact that we were competing with the inauguration and uh, and Lady Gaga's dress, um, <laughs> you broke the re you have broken the record for our, our virtual uh, JRC seminars. We had two hundred and fifty people attending today, which is a, wow. a record for us. So I think that really speaks to your um, your topic, and uh, it was really fascinating. And, and thank you for that. Uh, we're here. We're not here every Wednesday, but we are here me very many Wednesdays. So if you enjoyed today, please tune in to some more of our seminars. Um, but just to say thank you so much, Will, for joining us. And um, everybody, stay safe, stay healthy, and well. And uh, we'll see. Hopefully, we'll see you again. But thank you, Will. It was okay. Great. Thank you so much, Helen. It was it was a pleasure. And I'm sorry if I didn't get to some of your questions. But as I said, there was a lot of people. <laughs> and yeah. A lot of well, questions. But. Sure. And and I think um, I, you'll be sharing those questions and, and comments with me. So I, I do thank everyone yeah. who 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 contributed to the the questions. And I'll certainly take a look at all of your comments after the session.
That's fantastic. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us and uh, have the, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.